Okay, Hammy here. Today we're going to discuss section 14.1 out of our Biology 1 book called Human Heredity. Uh, in this section we hope to accomplish a few objectives. Uh, we hope to identify the types of human chromosomes, uh, the different kinds and how they're arranged in sizes and all that. Explain how scientists use pedigrees to study human traits, family histories, and start to take a look at some of the diseases that occur when the DNA is not quite right or the chromosomes are messed up. Okay, the first thing we want to look at is human chromosomes. Now, you'll, in order to get a picture of human chromosomes, what scientists do is they will take a picture under, uh, under the microscope of a cell that is going through mitosis. Remember, mitosis is cell division. So you take this long, stringy chromatin material where the DNA is all stretched out, and it coils up and condenses really tight. Okay, And, and they take a picture of it, and they can stain it. And they take that picture, and it's all these little pieces over here. And they stain it, and you see different banding patterns and different sizes. Scientists will actually cut them out or on the computer just trace around them and they will match them up based on size and banding patterns. And the picture you get of the human chromosomes is what we call a karyotype. Now if you remember humans have 46 chromosomes in most of our cells and the scientists organize them from biggest to smallest. Now, you'll notice that, well, why is, this, why is this big one down here? Well, the first 22 pairs right here, the first 22 pairs we call autosomes. And the last little pair right down here, okay, Notice there's an X and a Y chromosome, so that might be familiar to some of you. These are the sex chromosomes. There are genes, especially on the Y chromosome, that determine maleness and femaleness. Okay, so a, a male is going to be X, Y, and a female is going to be X, X. Okay. Now remember, you get a copy from each parent, so if we do a Punnett square, like this, divide it into four, so let's say your mother is X, X, father has an X and a Y, what is the chance that you will be a boy or a girl if you're a new baby? Well, you'll look here, these two X's come together, the here and here, these two X's come together, an X and a Y, X and a Y, and you'll see that there is a 50 to 50 ratio. 50%, 50%, about a one-half chance that you'll be a boy or a girl. So it should be an equal chance. What we've found in the world, though, that it, it's, it's actually about 101 male to about 100 female. Why is that? Well, that we think in some of the countries, this is a worldwide number ratio, in some countries like uh, China and India, where a male son to pass on the family name is more important. You'll get gender side where um, you'll, you value the males more and the others may be aborted, which is really sad, but it, it kind of throws this ratio off a little bit. And, and that's sort of their hypothesis as to why this number isn't equally 50-50. Okay, with these human chromosomes, scientists begin to study how chromosomes are passed uh, through the process of meiosis into the formation of gametes 
And then you get a selection, any combination of those gametes, sperm and egg, to make the new individual. Well, the scientists will construct what's called a pedigree chart to show the relationships in a family and also where the trait is present. So you'll also often see something that looks like this down here. So the squares, okay, the squares represent males. The circles are females, okay, where you have a horizontal line, okay, that's a union between the two. And then there's a vertical line to represent all of their children. Okay, so this couple right here had the oldest girl, and then they had two boys and a girl, and then another boy here on, on the end. Okay? And the pedigree continues into the third generation. So now this son right here goes and finds himself a beautiful wife over here from another family. She would have her, her own pedigree that could be attached here. And they have three children, two daughters and a son. Now, with this example right here where you see a half purple, half white, that means they are carriers or heterozygous for the trait. If they are completely shaded in, that means they exhibit that trait or have are showing that certain trait. So here's a daughter that does. Uh, dad is a carrier here. And so he has a daughter. He passes that gene. He, okay, these two over here get the normal gene. This daughter right here gets the trait gene from dad and the normal gene from mom. Marries another carrier. Look at their greater incidence of the trait than in their generation. Okay, it has to do with probability and some of those things we discussed back in the Mendelian genetics chapter. One of the most famous cases, or most often used, is the case of hemophilia, which is an X-linked gene, which we'll look at in a little bit here, found in European royalty. Well, if you're a king or a queen and you have daughters, you have the prince and princesses, right? Who do you want them to marry? Well, of course, other prince and princesses. And what began to happen is Queen Victoria, in eight, you know, back in the early 1800s, was a carrier, we think, for the hemophilia trait and begins to pass it down through all their kings here. Okay, a famous king here with hemophilia you might recognize as King Henry. Okay, but notice with an X-linked trait, all the shaded in ones, a great number of males in this royal family, you know, marry a prince from France and they have kids and they might marry another princess from Spain and so you see some of these families the lines begin to be interconnected for example here comes one down this way and they end up marrying kind of off that same family tree or pedigree okay only about second third cousin second cousin so you have a greater incidence of those recessive traits that we talked about in the previous chapter. Now when we look at the genes on the chromosomes, okay, the Human Genome Project, uh, which began in the early 90s, was actually sort of completed in 2000 and then in 2003 they said, hey, we're pretty much done. At first they thought, okay, we have everything, all the A's, T's, G's pretty much sequenced out. There's got to be hundreds of thousands of genes, right? Well, scientists have narrowed that down to about 20 to 24,000 genes. Okay? So now the next step is, where are those genes located? Of those 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, one from each parent, where are certain genes located? One of the first genes scientists found were involved with blood groups, blood types. Why? Because this was very important when we were able to do blood transfusions for surgery or different diseases where there's blood loss. And we noticed that if you got the wrong blood, you'd have a very bad reaction. Well, the two main protein groups they found were the ABO proteins and also the RH proteins. Now, the RH proteins uh, was actually discovered in the rhesus monkey. And that's where we get 
the RH from if that kind of is seems weird why we would use the letters RH. It comes from the rhesus monkey. The RH factor is either positive, meaning it's you have that protein on your surface of your red blood cell, or you're considered negative. So you say A positive or B negative. That's because you either have that protein or you don't. Okay, The A, B, and O gets a little bit more complicated. And if you look at the chart down here, if you have type A blood, that means you have these little A proteins, and they represent them in this chart as little circles on the surface of your blood cell. And then you have antibodies, that's in your immune system, so they are anti or against Bs. And so you see they're kind of a Y shape. They're going to be against or attack anything with the pointy shape. So if you put someone with type B blood that have B antigens into type A persons, someone with type A, their immune system will have a reaction within their blood, their white blood cells will attack these red blood cells, and you get this immune response, not good, okay? That, that person's gonna be very, very sick. Notice again, type B people have a more of a curve-shaped antibody, in their immune system that will does not like the A antigen. And someone with type A B blood have a gene for the A protein and the B protein. So we would say this is codominant. They are both showing up. The red blood cell has both the A markers and the B proteins on the surface of their cell, which means they don't have any antibody, which makes them the universal recipient, right? Okay, They can get blood from A, B, or O because they don't have any antibodies. Type O blood, think of O as a zero or O as a no. No antibodies on the, mark, on the surface and they have both antibodies, which means type O can only get blood from other people with type O. But because they don't have any proteins here to react with these antibodies over here, they are often called the universal donor. That's right. Okay. And so this was one of the first things we found because it was very important just uh, in, in surgeries and, and people that needed blood transfusions. Some other genes that we discovered, or we discovered that, that Disorders were passed different way, whereas hemophilia might be on the X chromosome, which made it sex-linked. Uh, more to come in a, in a future video here in the next section. We Or the blood types, which are codominant, meaning if you had that allele, it showed up. They started to find some disorders that were recessive alleles. So a mutation that caused a, a disorder, a something, a phenotype to be something to be wrong with that person. Now, in order to get a recessive allele, so like remember in pea plants, we had tall, mozygous tall, heterozygous tall, homozygous short. Okay, to get a recessive trait, if they're heterozygous, the dominant allele will overpower the recessive allele. The only way you can get a recessive disorder, genetic disorder, is if you are homozygous for that trait. Some examples would be PKU, uh, albino, albinism, uh, cystic fibrosis, which many of us are familiar with, someone with cystic fibrosis, or Tysox is another one uh, prevalent in the Jewish population or descent. <clears throat> if there are also diseases out there that are controlled by dominant alleles. Now, remember, dominant will overtake the recessive. So this will show up if you're homozygous dominant or even if you're heterozygous. So if you're going to inherit this dominant allele, it's going to show up. And one that's made the news recently is ALS. Okay? ALS uh, you'll, some of you will research this a little bit more in class, what those initials stand for, but it's a disorder of the, the nervous system and the neuromuscular system. Uh, famous baseball player, Lou Gehrig, uh, had ALS, and so it's often called Lou Gehrig's disease. It uh, affects people in their, when they're 30s, they're young, you know, big, good athletes, supposed to be strong and fit, and uh, can 
really it doesn't they don't show up till later in life so you often get married have kids and then you you find out later in life that you have this this gene this trait and you've already had kids and may have passed it on okay so it, this that's how these dominant alleles can keep being passed on a lot of diseases like huntington's disease uh, hypocholesterolemia you know if you have chronic high high cholesterol which can cause cardiovascular problems ALS um, don't show up till later in life so they often keep being passed on because people have already had kids okay now in the next section of this chapter we're going to continue to look at what are some of the common uh, genetic disorders found in humans and how are they passed and what chromosomes do they affect so I hope you learned something today, and I look forward to hope you look forward to uh, discovering more about some of these genetic conditions that affect people around us.